shopping around for favorable cannabis testing labs so, so a phenomena that we've covered here on the high at nine news before so a phenomena called lab shopping and i'm just going to read a brief because it's quite a long article but it's an article that quotes both chris nala and um josh so we'd like to have you guys chime in on on what the essence of, of of this article is and really so our listeners can understand what the issue is when it comes to testing i think a lot of people just like to throw testing on under the bus but we all know that you know uh, testing in a regulated environment is extremely important and being able to establish reproducibility from lab to lab is uh, perhaps at the, at the fundamental issue here. So the brief of the article reads like this. Laboratories licensed to test cannabis in markets regulated by the U.S. states claim that they're losing customers to competitors willing to provide favorable results. The lab shopping, quote unquote, uh, problem began with la when labs started inflating THCA levels. That's the cannabinoid that's found in the plant uh, and is the acid form of uh, THC uh, that, that's expressed in cannabis flower. But labs say they have evidence suggesting that competitors are also overlooking molds and pesticides, a little bit that we just touched on, uh, thus allowing contaminated products to reach consumers. Uh, regulators in some states are addressing fraudulent test results uh, better than uh, those in other states. A handful of states are opening up reference labs, so that's kind of like a state reference lab to kind of check up on these labs to help with investigations, but most facilities are slow getting up and running, and quite frankly, they're not very profitable if they're turning out real results, but they're losing business to other labs who are faking those results. So labs that play by the rules are tired of waiting for regulators to address what they say is now a public health issue. And uh, I'd like to start with, uh, with, uh, with Josh, because, you know, Josh, one of the things I, I, I found from, from reading this is that the uh, Cannabis Control Board in California got sick of listening to you and that you just went ahead and contacted Gavin Newsom directly in order to get some action done. So, first of all, that takes a lot of balls. Congratulations on that. But, man, so did that really um, – was the, was the view worth the climb on that? <laughs> I, I think it all is. I mean, about two years ago, I kind of got fed up with keep repeating myself and keep screaming in the background at the wall, aka the DCC, and probably supplying information, asking them to come shut my lab down because I must be this wrong in this industry, or that you have to do something to fix to correct an industry. So, after a lot of fails on the shelf, this would go back to the LA Times like timeline of that. Um, this is even the sixty-six pesticides. I mean, we had like. A quarter million SKUs on shelf in a 60 day period that failed horribly for pesticide contamination, like some of them up to 2,000 times the action level set out by the state, sitting on shelves, being sold widely, and reporting it to the DCC, and then no, no action happens because they don't have an internal testing lab. Spent hundreds of hours giving data packages and other things, kind of like Chris was talking about, looking at the data. And then after I started a countdown on the, some of these, like this was reported on this day, and then I had a spreadsheet that showed like, hey, 152 days has been passed since it was reported to you and there's no action taken. And I, I, I'd send a, a strong word letter over to him, as well as a lot of their staff. and. Um, it kind of showed the, the spreadsheet and then we're starting to see a change in the industry. It's, this isn't to attack any one person or anything else is to keep the public safe as they were consuming cannabis and we weren't to set these regulations out there. So that, that was the big push on Newsom uh, reaching out. Some of you will call it stupid. Some people call it balls. You can call it what you want. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Well, at least you got someone's attention. I mean, I, I think that again, I'm not sure that the uh, the ban that he threw down last week isn't at all related. But, um, you know, Chris, you and I have talked about this a lot. I mean, you know, the, the whole prohibition, the existence of prohibition has basically created a black market everywhere. And yeah, like all these folks who are doing CBD conversion over to make a cheap version of THC, this so-called hemp-derived THC, has really kind of upset the regulated cannabis market because these folks are operating 
outside a regulated environment, basically doing active pharmaceutical ingredient synthesis. Yeah, so they, they started with CBD conversions, and they it, when that became palatable to the public to have synthetic or semi, what they call semi-synthetic cannabinoids, um, they started to push the limits. And so now we see a lot of the products that are uh, labeled as hemp derivatives are not derivatives of hemp in any way. Things like THCP or HHCP do not have a a pathway from any constituents in hemp. So these are pure designer drugs. I'm not opposed to them, but they should be done in a very different manner. These should be done more in a pharmaceutical manner. Um, the levels of contamination that we see in these products is uh, exactly 100%. It's not 99.9. We, we see contaminated product all the time. Um, most of these contaminants are unknown in toxicity, so we don't know what we're dosing the public with. and. The thing is, what, what I guess is most frustrating for me is I spent the last 11 years fighting for cannabis, for to, to uh, legalize cannabis, to educate about cannabis and cannabis analytics. And here we have people who are doing uh, chemistry in their garage and basement under the cloak of, of hemp industry. Um, they're not the hemp industry. They're not even the cannabis industry, and they're taking uh, they're taking our reputation down as well as a lot of the hard work that we've been doing to justify and to promote cannabis use and consumption, both at the medicinal level and uh, for adult use consumption. And I want to bring up one thing too: that this this material is being, is being brought into the cannabis industry too. So I have a certified method with the state of Michigan to determine if delta nine THC came from a marijuana plant, a hemp plant, or if it was synthetically arrived in a laboratory. Um, the last runs in Michigan, the last one that ended two days ago, a study, 60% of the samples were conversion. The then one before that, about a month before that, 43.8. That was from 50 samples. Wow. The one before that was a couple hundred and it was about 30 uh, percent were actually synthetic. So the marijuana industry is selling synthetic cannabinoids as marijuana to unknowing and unwilling participants in a lab study. So, so what, what it's really come down to, I've talked about this on, on Hyatt 9 before, which is that it is cheaper to convert CBD. Now, CBD is tanked, what, to like a 250 a kilo. You could convert CBD into Delta 9, what they think is clean Delta 9, cheaper almost by a factor of 10 than getting a cannabis license, growing cannabis plants, extracting them, refining those extracts. To get the same molecule of THC, you're going to spend 10 times the amount of money. So it is literally the proverbial race to the bottom. And all of these hemp-derived beverages, you know, where you have like 10 milligrams of, of THC, hemp-derived THC, in a, in a beverage. Josh, you and I talked about this, right? You could still, even at that dilution, mm -hmm. still, still verify that that THC came from a chemical conversion of CBD and not from ex extraction, right? Yeah, hemp, I can determine if it's hemp, marijuana, or cannabis, even at the beverage, there's concentration stuff that you do. Um, that, 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 that is a good point, though. It is cheaper to make it, but the problem is that you talk to people actually manufacture Again, I'll say it again, negative, negative trans delta nine, which they're trying to manufacture as their analyte of interest. The expensive step is not the, the creation of it, it's the cleanup. So your price yeah. goes from you know, $250 production. So most CBD is being shipped in from China now, synthetically made mm -hmm. and grown on hemp plants. Mm -hmm. the, far, I mean, the amount of hemp plants grown in the United yep. States is, is below the amount before the farm bill even went, took effect. That's true. So it's not even growing CBD in the United States anymore. It's being shipped in in 55 gallon drums, converted into Delta 9 poorly with up to 60 byproducts. I'm finding them over 0.1%, which would be a good pharmaceutical limit to set on byproducts and conduct a study a safety study and efficacy study on on these byproducts so the, the problem is they're skipping the last step of cleaning it up so you can't actually produce a product in this in the manner that you're talking about for that cheap of a price because you need to do the cleanup step and i keep pushing people to do it we don't even screen for the right processing chemicals we don't look, we don't look at the byproducts and we don't look at um you can look at the different anti-emers but in the aerochemistry but i think you're good on that as far as safety yeah so you got so it yeah, so based on based on the cost of CBD right now, and let's say most beverages are a five milligram dose, mm -hmm. the cost of production without cleanup 
for this the delta 9 that's going into these beverages is 0.16 cents 0.16 cents of that oh. cost is delta 9 and then they're selling the beverage oh. for 6 to 8 dollars uh, your marketing in your can costs way more than the Delta 9 that's going into it. So um, as Josh says, if you're not cleaning up, cleaning up is the expensive time-consuming step. There is no requirement in any state to not poison people with these. It, that's the, ironic. Chris, then two things, if you think of it, if you do use hemp extracted Delta 9, if they, you don't want to use mother liquor, if there really is, and let's... We don't want to go into that. The price difference, it would jump it up from 0 0.01 cents to like 0 0.02 cents or something, right? Or so 0 0.03, that, right? It goes to, um, from hemp distillate, it's it's six cents per dose. Mm -hmm. And to, to do it from, from marijuana is eight cents per dose. Mm. Well, I guess we save a penny, oh. a couple pennies. Yeah. To, so it's all about profit, That's right? Why. Well, so the, the other kicker is that let, let's say you're doing this in a state regulated program. The producer is paying probably fifty to one hundred thousand dollars a year in licensing fees, inspection fees, uh, insurance. Um, there's a lot of expense that's associated with regulatory production of cannabis. These guys that are doing these conversions, sometimes in their garage and basement, or uh, they're basically unregulated production. They they're not even paying the state. Cannabis taxes, so Kate, taxes oftentimes can be 25%. Mm -hmm. um, you can buy these products sometimes without paying any tax. Well, because a lot of people, are, let's be real, the operators are buying these products from the illicit market. They're not buying them from, from a place where they're going to be paying taxes. And like, let's be honest, I do a lot of sourcing for these people. I've also done sales consulting for labs, one of which I saw on your uh, lawsuit, which was really disappointing because they were very much struggling because they had at that point in time a lab director who was very, very, very um, strong headed and wanted to be completely honest, which is why I come in because I'm selling on relationships, not the fact that, uh, you know, whatever. And also they were slow. So the turnaround time was a little better. Um, but, you know, it's it's a little disappointing to see. Let's not pretend like these operators don't know what they're doing. Let's not push by. I don't know. Where do you think the burden finally lies? Like, right, is it with the labs that aren't being um, operating with integrity? Is it with the operators who know what the hell they're doing? Is it a combination of both? And I don't know how much we can get into the lawsuit, but, you know, is there a monetary damage sought in that lawsuit? And is what is the basis on that? Is, is it, you know, I know this is awesome. I'm, I appreciate anybody who fights back and says what needs to be said, despite whoever has a bad opinion about it. I don't know why my thumbs up, thumbs down is going crazy, but all right, we're doing it today. Um, I, I definitely, that's one of the reasons why people dislike me, but I appreciate you, Josh, for saying what needs to be said, but is there a monetary value sought in, in connection to that, or is it truly just for public safety? It's no, true. I mean, it's, so, okay. Uh, there's a, for me personally, there's no monetary role okay. in doing this it's it's to correct an industry so safe product makes it to the consumers is there a monetary value in a lawsuit yes i'm not gonna lie on that that's how lawsuits work you can't just sue people to correct it um for a dollar yeah uh, there's there's no monetary value attached to it now so th there's a lot of things going on with that and i think the onus is you have a lot of different actors in it that could be held accountable for it uh, you could have labs you could have producers you could have a lot of different people but overall i, I mean i i believe that labs should be that safety gatekeeper to the general public my my customer is not the one who pays me my customer is the general public and if we're going to sit there pass tests or for, for forge fire or falsify results knowingly unknowingly either way that's still called lab fraud i don't care if hey i, I don't know how to run a lab but i'm running one that's called lab fraud you should not be doing that so I, I think they're going to stand up and I, I know there's a lot of people in this industry that have left the industry that are the actual chemists because we can't compete in this industry with actually using chemistry and getting it accurate and precise answers. But then we end up leaving the industry because we can't compete against the guy pressing a button that doesn't know what the button does. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't know if that answered all your questions. No, you covered it, and I appreciate that. I was just, you know, those are my own curiosities because I've seen how some of these sales programs work, and I'm definitely, I think it's disgusting to, to sell false test results, especially if those are failed for something that's potentially dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very much so, very much. Dr. T, did you have anything that you wanted to, 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 to ask on this? 
Yeah, I'm yeah. sort of also thinking about the consumer and wondering, you know, what can they buy? You know, is it that they just grow a plant in their backyard? Um, should they only buy flowers? Uh, you know, uh, it seems to me that any extracted uh, can be also converted without a clear line of that. And so I'm worried about any vape cart, uh, gummy, anything that's being produced out there. So that, that's why I tell people yes, not sir. everyone is a bad actor or, or the people doing this are slipping something under someone's nose. You got to find the trusted companies, the companies out there doing the above and going above and beyond to do the testing. I have people in California that test every batch for conversion. I have people testing extended pesticide testing with every batch to make sure they're not contaminating the product. And they'll gladly throw away these products or not put them on the shelf if it fails any of these things. Those are the, the, the people that, are, that should be like leading the charge in this industry. I think you're seeing a change in California. And I, I, I've been doing this for a long time in California. The light got pretty dim and people like Elliot Lewis stepping up and taking a stance on this with the voice he has. I appreciate that kind of stuff. Thomas Martin from Raw Gardens out there saying a lot of things too. These are people that are leading a charge and a movement in an industry to create a safe product again. And we're getting away from just the ultimate dollar, making a dollar everywhere and looking at this. Like I said, I've donated more time and service to this industry than any other lab that I know personally. Um, and I'll say, yeah, I've done that. And I, Chris, I'm not taking for you. Chris, you do a lot of stuff too. And I'm talking about California. Mm -hmm. yep. Fair, fair, fair enough. So, uh, fair enough. Oh, go ahead, please, Chris. So, what I'll ask Josh, why is it on us to foot the bill for this? Um, like you, we do our own secret shopper. We we provide free use to mold testing for anyone in the state of Massachusetts, whether it's producer, retailer, home grower, patient. Because yeast of mold is so prevalent in Massachusetts regulated retail, we offer anyone free yeast of mold testing. And 50 to 60 percent of the products that are purchased in retail that we've tested, it's not a huge data set, but 50, 50 to 60 percent are contaminated with failing levels of mold. I 100% wow. agree. I just did a micro study in Michigan. I have 33% uh, fail on shelves the other day. Mm -hmm. These, the onus shouldn't be on us. The onus is on us because we care too much, I think. And we, we have scientific integrity and, and we care about the final product of these patients. Um, I think the onus goes back to the states, the, the state run labs, the state regulators. They, they, they need to do a better job at what they're doing. And I'm not trying to bash anyone out there or any one person in the department, but we need to step it up. There needs to be regulatory action. They need to do, 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 do the shelf testing and things like that because it can't be on people like me and Chris. I did that pesticide study because I know what's going on just from being in the industry too long, and I'm kind of sick of being quiet. I've been out trying to get to someone to go involved, be involved in that for years, and no one wanted to. And this is a common practice done by states in all sorts of industries. You know, Washington State does this pesticide screening all the time, actively. Mm -hmm. They're screening off lists for a very large list of pesticides in the cannabis market to make sure people aren't using it. But for some reason, not all states are doing the same thing. And I think that's the thing. The onus shouldn't be on us. But I, I mean, not people will say, why do I take it upon myself? I take it upon myself because I think this industry needs to change if it wants to stay. I think this industry is a very important industry. I think cannabis should be legal and should be everyone should be able to consume it. But at the same time, someone consuming safe cannabis under the false pretenses is safe cannabis and then ends, ends up dying at an early age because they're consuming it is not appropriate. And that, that's what I, I, that the, kind of drives me to do this kind of stuff. And I appreciate you doing that work. I think that's super commendable, and I think that's that's awesome. And I hope you weren't offended by my questions. How far do we push this bonus, though? And like, why do I test this? Because I think that's great that you guys are willing to do the other work, right? Until the state's like, you know what, fuck it, we'll just take over all the labs. So the federal government comes in when we have a federal policy finally in the year twenty ninety seven or whatever it's going to actually happen, um, and they're just like, you know what, we'll control all the lab testing. Everything will be a state owned and sponsored lab. I don't think it'll happen. I don't think they want that responsibility. <laughs> I don't think states want more responsibility to tell the truth, especially take testing. Especially when they're not That's taking true. any responsibility for what they're doing now. Exactly. Yeah, Chris points out in, in, his, in the article, I'll, I'll, I'll quote you here, Chris. I provided to our Cannabis Control Commission on the order of thousands of data points that would indicate fraud, malfeasance, and incompetence. And what did they do? What did the state of Massachusetts do about that, Chris? Nothing to date. I, you know, we're waiting years to we're waiting years to see action. And let me go back to that quote. One of the things that can be very difficult, and I think Josh alluded to this, sometimes the <laughs> 
difference between uh, fraud and malfeasance and incompetence, it, it's very gray. And it's not to, it, it's hard to distinguish whether something's intentional. But as Josh said, it's still fraud if you're incompetent. If you're incompetent okay. and you're running a lab, that's, that's still fraud. It's kind of like, I think the people like, running Massachusetts is also pretty incompetent as well, because I think they're a little too busy trying to defend that lady's job than, uh, than worry about actually correcting those issues that you brought to her. It's, it's, that's, a, that's been the most troublesome thing working in these regulatory A public safety problem should take first place. Not, I'm worried that we're going to clog up supply chains or this is not going to make the product. Why can't we do regulatory holds on products till investigations are finished instead of selling it through on a shelf? So that's utterly insane to me. Um, there's a lot of proof and evidence out there that reporting and all this stuff that, that we've been doing for years. And I would like to see some kind of regulatory change. Why also, why the government won't take this on? It's a lot of work. I, I think I think they will leave the labs, but they just need to regulate it better. I mean, most industries are tested by independent testing labs. And the thing about this industry is what, what I've seen troubling too is uh, the analytical industry, normally when, you, when you're doing, running a testing lab, you get scrutinized by your customer. You know, scrutiny is, hey, let's see your SOP. Let's make sure you're up and up. You do yearly visits up to them. And you're making sure that we're, we're keeping control of what we're doing. And you're, you're grading us on how well we do our job. In the cannabis industry over the years, it was quite the opposite. How poorly are you doing your job? And then I'll, I'll go ahead and use you. And that's what we've seen in the past. Uh uh, I'd like to interject with a quick political digression. Oh, boy. It's great once again to see uh, my friend Socialist Jenny advocating for government stop regulation it, and control it. of an industry. Not uh, advocating very, for it at all. Uh-uh. I'm not advocating for it at all. I'm saying, 100% is there a point out of, where right. out of line with the GOP? I have a real question. Out of line with the GOP platform of government uh, deregulation, allowing mm-hmm. corporations to do whatever they want to us, including ending the USDA, oh, FDA, oh boy. The EPA. I'm down with ending the that. Project FDA. 2025 crew has written out in plain black and white. Project 25 of 2024 is not. They're going to try to end the EPA. Bro. Stop spreading oh, that ridiculous. Boy, and it's all environmental regulation it. pointed the, at corporations to keep Americans safe. Stop the cap. As much as you want, Matthew, this dress is lilac, not purple. So yeah. you're not going to pull me over, but I appreciate you mixing my words. Don't need to pull own. you over, Jenny. I'm just pointing own. out your. <laughs> socialist ideals and propositions that's okay it's oh, okay to be boy. a good person oh, an asshole boy. and a republican all at the same time that's right i think i think jenny's stance is really in line with the scandinavian social democracies of norway i think we're distracting from they the fact that we have on. really hey, great brains Matthew, Jermaine, I, have real, right I have a real question for chris i have a serious <laughs> question for chris before jay yes so chris you stated earlier um that that 100 percent of the products um, that you tested that are of the hemp derived cannabinoids um, test tested dirty or didn't pass or were fails or ho- however you want to word that. Um, how many products like that have you actually tested and, and, and were they a range of all different types of products or was it just within, within one particular demographic like vape carts or gummies or something? Yeah, so I, I would say it's probably close to 5,000 products. Um, some of them are, uh, I would say the majority of them are finished consumer products, but we do have a lot of uh, examples where these are raw ingredients. So oftentimes producers of these distillates uh, are selling them to people who are then making gummies in final form, and they're unaware that they're heavily contaminated. Um, typically, we see up to 35 different Synthetic byproducts, it's not uncommon to see 35. We've seen contamination levels that is, uh, I think, 47 or 50 percent of the product was the highest level of contamination. So when you're smoking on a Delta-8 vape pen that is 40 per- 47 percent not Delta-8, mm-hmm. and it's something, it's probably ISO-THC, this was before we knew what the, the ISOs were, um, of unknown toxicity. You know, that's, I, I did not coin the term frankenoid, but we, we talk about this as frankenoid roulette. Roulette, the, the chance is these products will not kill you. There is a, there is a significant chance that they won't kill you. Early. Interesting. I think too, Chris, back to the 47% stuff, a lot we've seen is, is fillers. So like vitamin E acetate was that big, mm. was that really popular, but there's a lot of other ones being used. I've done a study in multiple states and with the hemp industry. I still today find product on the shelf in the hemp industry that's 50% vitamin E acetate a day. Mm. It's, it's crazy. Yep. Fair, fair, fair enough. Man, this has been fascinating, fascinating. Uh, anyone else have anything else that they would like to ask the doctors in regards to this and, and the lab technicians while they're here? 
I just want to thank Chris and Josh for coming on today Most and joining definitely. and providing such great, such great color to this article. I do I have a quick it. question. Thank you guys. Does anyone know of a vape uh, manufacturer that is located in the United States and uses U.S. sourced uh, inputs to manufacture U.S. made vape carts? No. I'm not aware of any. Yeah, there are, there are no. Sounds like a great, sounds like a great uh, business opportunity. The, the, you know, the Let's problem with one could just, you know the problem with one that, could educate Matthew the Saint customers Germain? that the slight, one could educate the customers that the slight air cost would be offset by a, a much greater chance of safety. And that might be a, uh, a pain mm. point solution for business. It's probably not. It's, I mean, let's be real. They're going to pay more and they don't care to. Exactly. They're, yeah, they're not going to want to pay for that. The, the, the cost of labor is, is far too expensive in, in, in the U.S. for that type of production work. Well, that's Some people will pay more for well-made USA-made products, such as my people like myself. I always buy Sharpies over other pens, even though they cost more. I always buy USA made <laughs> knives. I'm uh, so excited. Even cost more. He's advocating for tariffs, you guys, so we uh -huh. can't ship all this business to oh, China. I'm not advocating for tariffs. I'm, I'm yes, you I'm are. For yes. US manufacturing. yes, you are, because that yep. because oh, we yeah. know that no, a lot not, of these no, we know that US businesses are often not mm -hmm. going to make these purchases because they're more expensive. So the, how do we shut that down? We tariffs. make tariffs so that we can't send right. money oh. to non ethical Chinese People's Republic, mm -hmm. people's whatever of China. Uh, manufacturer. Sorry, I got a little excited. A little. I'm against tariffs, but I am pro it, pro USA manufacturing. I actually almost opened a store at the mall called the Made in the USA store. You're a little purple but today. Ooh. I realized really I'd have to purple. be at the mall every day, so I didn't do it. I think he's trying mm -hmm. to chameleon you, uh, Jenny. He's trying to match your match your uh, your, your lavender. <laughs> I love guys, it. I'm a it's psychedelic. Lilac. I'm a psychedelic yeah. anarcho-communist. I believe in local production of of all goods and services. I believe in small local networks oh, and trusted networks. So I also believe in the fact that we're all a one human family and we need to stop murdering each other and stealing all of each other's stuff. Well, talk to the Dems about shipping all our production facilities over. To Neither China Democrat nor Republican. Cheaper. All right, we're going to we're going to roll into a commercial. Again, it's not the Democrats who right shipped back. our stuff over the seas. We're going into a commercial. It was both the we're Democrats right and the Republicans with NAFTA and their other free trade agreements like GATT. It was all of the politicians, you guys. 